That's another Zoom feature. Shalom, everybody, and welcome. We are starting our concluding class <laughs> for the Omer series with yet another class about Oritzvi Greenberg's poetry. And you all understand, I know by now, that no matter even if we had three times as many classes I, I, or about Oritzvi Greenberg's poetry, we will still be just scratching the top and there is so much more to learn about his writing. And one of the things I did last time is that I showed you a whole poem and then just the excerpts that I decided to highlight out of it. And even when I put those excerpts on the screen, you will see that we will not be discussing all of it, but still highlighting part of it, the essential. But it's really an invitation uh, to look for a more Oldsby Greenberg to read with a warning, very little is translated into English. But what is, is worthwhile exploring. So again, as always, let us start with the question, if since last week, anybody came up with a thought, an insight, a question that you would like me to address as we start class today. And no hands, so let us go back to the PowerPoint and I'm gonna put it on the screen for us to look at. And here we go, hang on. We, let me recap a, where we have been. So this was where I showed you how long the whole poem is in Ivrit and the little excerpt that, and, and it's more than one page. It's like, you know, Keter Kina Lekol Be David, the beginning of Rehovot Nahar, the streets of the river. And I just showed you this to illustrate the length. I made the reference to a Ha, you may remember last time. And then we started looking at the poem itself. And the foci of what we really paid attention to last time was the, uh, and as we go into this first, the opening of the great lamentation and the Echa reference is there for a good reason, is by starting with the being led, the being taken, having to leave home this march, walk, deportation, whatever name you want to give it, what happens on the way. And the reactions we will want to look at is nature, God, and the non-Jewish neighbors. These are the elements that Uritz V. Greenberg, again, he doesn't see. He lives in Eretz Israel when all this is happening, but he is trying to envision those elements and from the first slide dedicated to this poem we will see that on the first verse no mercy kindled under god's heavens it's a goyim universe so the recognition of the whole environment in which the jews are now walking slash a or living walking slash to their death is a Goyim universe. Nature in itself had taken the, the you know, the, the appearance of Goyim. It's not a Jewish world anymore. It's not a Jewish universe anymore. In the following verse that I highlighted for you comes the question, are these really normal creatures, normal human beings? Did they have a mother? Was Shema Israel whispered over them by a loving mother? So if nature had turned its face to become a Goyim universe, one can now doubt whether these creatures led so cruelly to their death are indeed regular human beings. Did they deserve to have a childhood like everybody else? So you see that Orozvi Greenberg is now rushing, not rushing like straight Dorch, as the Israelis often will say, to the site of the killing, to the site of the shooting, the site of the gas chambers, etc. No. He is trying to envision the process of how this happens and how the whole world is 
falling apart and therefore you doubt your place in the universe, you doubt your normalcy and your humanity as a Jew. As we come to the second slide, let us continue our reading in the same way. And uh, I will want to, to have readers today. So I know Jean, you're willing, and Judy, Josie, are you good for today as well? Yeah. Yes, okay. So uh, let us uh, go start the second slide of Kina Lebed David, the first poem of Rehovot Nahar. And I'd like to remind you again that I say the first poem of Rehovot Nahar, The Streets of the River, but we remember that Urs V. Greenberg had instructed for the inclusion of an earlier poem that was written prior to the Shoah and on the opening pages of The Streets of the River. And only then does he start his new, if you wish, poem. And we have read about those people who walk on the ground, those people who think that they are the last Jews in the world, a horrible nightmarish vision that Orzwe Greenberg had already in the 30s. We are now with this march. I'm doing very little of the Ivrit because this is long and I'd like to have time for us to look at everything that I prepared for you today. So the price to pay will be a less of the Ivrit, but a little we always do. Zkenim, Nearim, Imahot, Vechkalot. Gam Yonkei Shadaim, Shenoadim Laalot, Lesinai, Hapchadim, Velaredet Labor. Lishkavim kulam veze sof hamagor. Alma velama ki hem yehudim. Hakdoshim baolam val ken avudim. Verachel bakever baderech en sham. Shetishma le mitzad hamudea. Ule kol bechi levavam vedamam beyom shol. אימנו רחל זה באמצע יום חול מובילים הגויים את בנייך לשאול. ויפה התבל ושדותיה מותקים ועלינו הגזר ושמיים שותקים. I'm always pulled into this and read more that I plan to because of the absolute beauty of the Hebrew. Uh, Josie, will you start maybe today with old man, young boys? Please unmute. Old men, young boys, mothers and brides, suckling babies doomed to mount to Sinai of fears and descend to the hole to live with everyone. This is the end of fear. Why and what for since they are Jews, the holiest in the world and therefore lost. No Rachel on the road to hear her darlings march and the sound of their heart weeping and their blood on the day of bereavement. Mother Rachel, in the midst of a week's day, the Goyim are leading your sons to hell and the world is beautiful. It's field so sweet. The verdict is upon us and heavens are silent. <clears throat> when the foe came, what did the Jews have in this world? Millions of men and not one sword. The distractedness of a sheep before the slaughter. There were mezuzot, synagogues, scrolls, flags of all nations, prayer shawls and phylacteries, stores and workshops and wares, sounds and voices, weeds of forgetfulness along the trails. Okay. As you can see, the richness of these lines and those verses is immense. And we could take this as a Talmud page and spend a whole week just on it. But let's start with the Zkenim, Ne'arim, old men, young boys, mothers, brides, etc. Bizkenenu uvenarenu, very clear biblical reference. But look at and then in each verse, I will try to just focus on one little element. 
suckling babies doomed to mount to Sinai of fears and descend to the hole. So these babies who are now carried by their mothers to lie with everyone, this is the end of fear. The image of Oritz V. Greenberg is that this is a reverse image of Sinai. Just like we believe that we have all gathered in Sinai to reverse Torah, now there is a negative like we used to have in photography. You remember the negative of the film where everything white is black and everything black is white, a reverse world. This is the Sinai HaPchadim, uh, the Sinai of fears. The, so here you do not receive Torah. You are not elevated, but you descend to the hole to lie with everyone. And this is the end of fear. So there is no way to salvation. There is no other way out but death. You will stop being afraid when they kill you, when, to lie in the hole with everybody else. I must tell you that the juxtaposition of Sinai and Auschwitz, the two places where we have gathered in the first to receive Torah and the covenant with God, with God and in the second to be annihilated, to be effaced from the face of the earth is not unique to Oritz V. Greenberg. And you may know that I teach in that other Institute of Jewish Learning, not so far away from Pardes, called the Hartman Institute. And the Hartman Institute was created by Rav David Hartman, Zichrono Livracha, who arrives in Israel in the 80s and one of the first things he writes and publishes in Medinat Israel, where he arrives at the time and, and, and not yet uh, the creator of Machon Hartman that will come in those years, is an article called Auschwitz and Sinai. And it is available both in English and in Hebrew. And you know what, Deborah, if you're still there, if not, I hope you're there. I can send you a copy to it. It's available on the Hartman Institute site. I'm here. Okay. Here. I'll send it to you and then you can send it out to people because it, it, there is an Ivrit and then English versions. I'm not sure in which language he wrote it. Probably both. He probably did both versions. And it is interesting because he comes to that in the 80s when he arrives to Israel. And this is something from the 50s. So 30 years before, Ulrich Greenberg already created this metaphor of the Shoah as the opposite of Sinai. There we are gathered to be born as a nation. Here we are gathered to be finished as a nation, as, as people. And what a, a Rav David Harman is, is addressing in that article is that in Israel of the 80s, he is absolutely stunned to find out that the images of Auschwitz as the ultimate raison d'etre for us having a state of Israel, for us being justified in what we do, for the reasons to have a state of Israel, had overtaken the notion of Sinai as if the reason to who we are and what we are is all only what was done unto us. And he talks about the need to bring back the memory of Sinai to the Israeli psyche. Hence, Auschwitz and Sinai. This is an article that I teach oftentimes when I start teaching about Holocaust literature in Israel because it had made the Shoah as the crux of the matter, and I know how important it is, I mean, you don't need to persuade me, and yet it is not what makes us or unmakes us. We were not created because of Hitler, okay? And to give Nazism that posthumous victory to be the reason, the, the ultimate reason of who we are is, David Harman thinks, not me, is absolutely wrong. So I'd like to call your attention to the fact that this is something that was in the mind of more than one person. I never researched it to the depth, but probably Oritz V. Greenberg is the first one. 
to see. Rachel? Yeah. Uh, this is Judy. Um, I, I recently read um, uh, uh, some writing of De uh, David uh, Weiss Halivni, um, who is also a great scholar of, of uh, Judaism. And he also talks about the, the covenant and the withdrawal of the covenant at Auschwitz, that comparing mm -hmm. these two events. Yeah, so, uh, so as I said, it was probably, I don't want to say common because there is nothing common about this way of thinking, but it was in the mind of people, you know what, I'm gonna make a guess because of how we speak of Sinai as the place where we were all there together and there is something in the gathering, mainly at Auschwitz, you know, with no differences with how you were Jewish and what kind of Jew you were, we were all there. And just like the whole door the door in every generation, you need to see ourselves as if we were the ones to come out of Sinai. Modern Israeli literature oftentimes use the term Behold door the door, we need to see ourselves as we were saved from the Holocaust, as we came from there. So this is, I would say again, I'm not using the word common, but it is a recurrent motif in the thinking about the Shoah. And we have one of its earlier appearances here. So it's worth to note. As we continue down this page that we are reading now, here comes another element that is so simple as if it doesn't need to be stated and yet think about how much it does need to be stated. Almaze velama ki hem Yehudim. Why and what for since they are Jews? Now, this is a notion, again, that we think like self-understanding. Of course, it happened to them because they are Jews. But I'd like to highlight it from a different perspective. No matter that this poem is written and published in Medinat Israel in the 50s, Ulrich Zwei Greenberg is a European. And for, for the purpose of this argument, I will call it him a European. And Europe of the 20th century is absolutely in its general universal thinking, proud of the result of the Napoleonic era that a, made it so that judiciary systems embrace the notion that you are innocent until proven guilty which in itself was not so simply understood. But by the end of the 19th century, it becomes part and parcel of people thinking about justice. You need to prove guilt. When the Shoah happens and normal people who think so, why do they punish them thus? And the answer is because they are Jews. So there is a transference in meaning being born a Jew in itself is a crime punishable by death. This is the novelty of Nazism. Because there was earlier anti-Semitic, you know, <laughs> do we not know that anti-Semitism existed for so many generations before? But sometimes it was hiding under the pretense that we do this to you because you, whatever, exploit our money. We do this to you because you don't turn to Jesus. If you only were ready to convert, we will accept you, etc. Nazi antisemitism is different from that point of view by creating the equation that being born a Jew is in itself a crime punishable by death. And this is what Oral Zwei Greenberg highlights here. And therefore, it's poetically interesting to say how the proximity of this line comes, is next to the lines about the babes in arm. Because that now sort of explains it, that those babies need to be killed as well. Why? Since they are Jews they already come under this regulation. 
the Midrash, if you wish, the holiest in the world and therefore lost. So again, putting this juxtaposition from my perspective, Jews are the holiest in the world, but the world cannot accept it. And then we come to this beautiful stanza, longer than the previous one, juxtaposition what is juxtapositioning what is happening now to the classical biblical notion that if and when we are led away from our country, if and when we come back, there will always be Rachel Imeno to see our plight when we have to go to welcome us when we finally come back. So the stories of both the book of Genesis, the death of Rachel on the road while traveling, and Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, Rachel Mevaka Albanea, as Rachel is weeping for her children. And hear what Uri Tzvi Grimberg brings, no Rachel on the road. So even the biblical prophecy will not come true. This world that we are living now is a total destruction of everything we knew. No God, no normal birth, no acceptance by nature. The system, the legal system broken down and now even the biblical prophecy. So no Rachel on the road to hear her darlings march and the sound of their heart weeping and their blood on the day of bereavement. Mother Rachel in the midst of a week's day, the goyim are leading your sons to hell. And here comes again a notion that we have seen in Bialik's Al Hashchita already 50 years earlier in 1904, like the sun was rising and the wheat was growing and the shochet slaughtered. So in the world is beautiful, it feels so sweet and the verdict is upon us and heavens are silent. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Let me just pull out so I can see all of you properly. Go ahead, Golda. So he wrote this after Hakamat Hamadina, right? Of course, fifties. So he saw if he could if he could relate Hakamat Hamadina to the fulfilling of a prophecy. So how could he write about the complete breakdown of biblical uh, or negate the truth or the his belief in biblical words when he saw if what or did he interpret Hakamat Hamadina as the um, fulfillment of a vision, a biblical Do vision. all Jews interpret Hakamata Medina as a fulfillment no. of a vision? No, so I'm asking, did he? I don't think or, so. Yeah. For Ulrich Grimberg and people thinking alike, Hakamata Medina was yet a far cry from the fulfillment of the vision. Let me remind you that he mourns in a, no, not remind, tell you because it's not translated into English. He has an angry poem about the fact that we gave up on the Jewish quarter during 48 and then struggled to keep Yerushalayim. He will be mad in 67 when Moshe Dayan will let the walk control Temple Mount. This is a group of ideologists and thinkers who are thinking that the state of Israel is yet a far cry from the fulfillment of the vision. Okay, fulfillment, but what about Tchilat? Reshit, you know, so, Tchilat, he doesn't see it that way. No, and then again, he is writing about 10 years before and the Shoah and Rachel wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, she wasn't there mm -hmm. and God wasn't there as you can see, I mean, you can object to other lines when he says that God wasn't there mm -hmm. and Rachel wasn't there, that the, the, the Shoah is the breaking down of everything we knew, all the promises, all the structures, all the legal systems, all the existence of the divine. Let me also remind you that a Rav Kook, the son, Yehuda Kook, in what I taught when I taught about the poetry of 1967, in that famous speech in Yom Ha'atzmaut 67, just before the Six Day War, when a Merkaz Arav used to have their great festive dinner, 
and he stood up and it wasn't a poem really, but I teach it as a poem, as a literary text. And he laments, Efo Hebron, Efo Shechem, how did we dare give up on the whole of the land? This is like three weeks before a, the Six Day War. So many people see this as a prophecy of what was to come. But ideas such as Oritzvi Greenberg, such as Yitzhak Shalev, the father of Meir Shalev, who belongs to, again, the same ideology. They did not see the state of Israel as yet that. Tchila, maybe, I'm not sure. But for now, no. Does this help? Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Back to the poem. Okay. Let us go to the last verse on this page, not at all the last verse of this poem, where he says, and when the foe came, what did the Jews have in the world? And then there's the whole description, million, millions of men and not one sword. Now, this is already a very Eretz Israel slash Medinat Israel of looking at the reality of pre-state situation of the Jews, which Zionism came to amend, which the state of Israel did manage to set right. We lived an existence in which we didn't worry about being armed. We didn't worry about the need to defend ourselves. And we had all those other elements that make us who we are, the mezuzot and the synagogues and the scrolls and the flags of the nations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Getting ready for a class I'm teaching later today, which is ideologically speaking, the exact opposite, Alterman of the time. And the poem that is maybe, I don't know, within three years of this one. So the same period, the same decade, referring to the way we treat the memory of the Shoah in the state of Israel, highlighting the rebellion and the resistance and looking down on everybody else. Alterman had a lot to write about that. And I'm teaching some of it again, a long poem of which I will teach excerpts. And in the last, in many poems relating to this, what he calls Halekach Ledor, the lesson for generations to come, one of the lessons is we should never be unarmed. We should never be helpless. So in spite of the great distance between Urotzvi Greenberg and Nathan Alterman, which by the way, I think is not that great, but people like to present it like that, they reach the same conclusion. And I would say very Eretz Israel slash Medinat Israel. We got it right now. They could do this unto us because we were unarmed, before, because we were unready, because we never worried about these things. We, and Mishtamea, what you learn from this, we should do better, okay? We should learn to be different. Let me put on, so here is the Rachel element. Here is the nature element. It remains beautiful, does not fit to the horrors that we are living. And of course, the lesson to be learned, we need to learn to be different. I don't want to say necessarily better because what was wrong with being unarmed, it's not a crime, but we need to learn to be different. And we are coming uh, to the next page. Uh, Josie, would you like to continue for a bit? Okay, again, I'm doing, I, I'll try now to do very little of the Ivrit, but just for a little bit. Ech uvlu, derech kfar shanan reach pri urefatot bechol geder bikta amda pnei psifas hanatsrut veshikta kol uchlosiyat haikar vechikta lirot bamachaze. So machaze is a show, is a theater piece, and the assumption of this particular part of the poem now on our slide is there is the show of the Jews being led to be killed 
and the whole village is coming out to watch. Let us just read this, this whole part A to the end, how they were led. How they were led across a peaceful wet village, the smell of fruit and cow sheds. In every hut and fence, there stood the face of Christian mosaic, silently, all the peasantry waiting to see the show. Jews being led to their death on one side, a pair of shoes to get, every peasant is hoping, from the feet of Ajid to his death walking. With the German's consent, he who is leading the slaughter. If the German agrees, the peasant is checking for the right Jid by the worth of his shoes. My miserable brother hastens to kneel with his holy hands, he unties his shoelaces, his forehead so close to the Christian soil, it is the very fear now falling apart. Sunny crops to one side, its way to the killing. He removes his shoes and hands over the goy's fee, his shoes. In each one of his eyes, fear sparkles like a star. It is not his heart, but the sea waves beating inside him. He pulls his hand back from the goys. What a miracle, the goy did not take them to pull him upside down to the cross. Sweet Jesus, it's Ajid. It's altar's day now. Thank you. Again, in itself, this could be a complete poem on its own. And I need to, I know how repetitive I am, but I will do it. Oris V. Greenberg is not a witness. He is in Eretz Israel when he writes this. Probably in the silence years, we don't know that. But it is published only in the 50s. You remember that we discussed the years of silence by Oris Swigrenberg. And he can, in his mind's eyes, just as we discussed in earlier sessions, his ability to be sensitive to a possible future of killing by death, of crawling in underground tunnels, of thinking you are the only Jew in the world, which he writes in the 20s and the 30s. In the same way, he can bridge not only the distance of time and see ahead, he can be present while he was not present. And think of how he must feel because he will tell us very shortly, like, after he writes this in his apartment in Tel Aviv, he goes out to the Macaulay. He sits in a coffee shop with friends. Will he go to the theater that night to see a real show when he is absolutely capable of, of crossing the time backwards and the distance and see this image, this show, happening. The Jews are led probably by the Germans. Peasants are looking. Who are these peasants? Their neighbors, their clients in the whatever grocery store that the Jew was running or, or anything else, the shoe repair. And now one of the peasants likes the boots or the shoes that one of the Jews is wearing. And only, all it takes is just a movement, a gesture, and you get the German's consent. And then you'll have all this image of the Jew kneeling down, unlacing his shoes, and actually what is created in this show is a Christ-like image. And indeed the Jews forehead is close to the Christian soil, the land. The Jew is now like being crucified. The Jew now becomes the one who carries the burden of the sins of the world. Sweet Jesus, it's a, G a Jid. Its altered day is now. Christianity is back to its basis and you are crucifying the Jew and the price is his pair of shoes. But think that for a moment at least, the Jews must be believing that if I only give him the shoes, maybe 
while the Christian is probably thinking, well, they're going to kill you, so I might as well get the shoes before, you know, because why waste a good pair of shoes? And the pair of shoes are now the thing worth worth salvaging, the thing worth rescuing are the shoes, not the Jews. Okay? And he can see all of this from El Israel. Let us continue. Okay, so this indeed is the theater show, show because he really makes it possible for us to see as you look at this little box that I put on now so that we can look at it uh, more in detail. This is mamash what is happening. We get the dramatic instructions as we would have if we read a drama. Let us, I'm constantly looking at my watch because there are two elements in this poem that I yet want to see or maybe three. And then there is the great poem I want to conclude with. Okay, Jean, will you take over and read for us a little bit, perhaps among them? Perhaps among them tiptoed my father and my mother, my sisters, their husbands, their children, and the sorrow of the end in the holiness of their faces. As they passed by the forest, they thought, had he wanted to have pity on us by a miracle, out of the forest would come our good son at the head of a battalion to avenge us with a sheathed sword. God pitied them not. He did not send me with the battalion on the road to Treblinka to redeem. There is Hester Panin in heaven, simple. Therefore, I do not understand how they lived and went where the Germans led and barked, fear into their hearts, forgetting all chesed, feet swelling. How come they did not grind their teeth and swallowed that flower to die by it then? How were they led to the furnace? How our loved ones were spread like an altar's manure over the gold thorium's fields. Okay, two elements very quickly, but the one in the first, in the first part of what we have on our screen is a crucial one. Can you by interference read in this the pain of for the six years of World War II, 1939 to 1945, when you live peacefully, relatively in Eretz Israel, go about your business, fall in love, get married, get divorced, have children, bury parents in a normal way, do your business. And you start at least from 42, knowing what is happening because by July 42, they know. We, we have a date when it first appears in the, in the papers of El Israel, British Mandate, Palestine. And then this helplessness to do nothing. Remember, Orzwe Greenberg is the great supporter of the Irgun and the uh, Stern Gang, as it is referred to. I prefer the name in Hebrew, the Lechi. So, his belief, his ideology, as we have seen on the first screen, is about the need of Jews to do something. And he is now in Eretz Israel, not yet the state of Israel, not yet IDF, but already having arms and trying to do something and we can do nothing. But he doesn't tell us that I was sitting in Tel Aviv being totally impotent and incapable of doing anything. No, look at how his mind works. He doesn't tell us about his own feelings of regret. He is letting us see them thinking about him. The guilt is so deep that he needs for us to see them his father, his mother, the sisters, the husband, the children. And I know that they were hoping that we from Eretz Israel will appear. 
that I myself would appear to help them. And I couldn't. And I wasn't there for them. And then the conclusion of these lines, of course, is Hester Panim. You need to know that this is not an official translation. This is something that I've done myself. So as always, uh, ideas and suggestions for corrections are welcome. And I have decided this line to not translate, but leave the Hebrew expression of hysterpanim. Hysterpanim is a Jewish notion that when found in front of the absolutely inexplicable of how God allows a certain thing to happen, one of the ways to handle it in Jewish thought is the notion of hysterpanim, that God covered his face. Not that he wasn't there because he's always there, but there was something that allowed or made it for him not to see, not to be seen. Hester Panim. The face is not revealed. The face is covered. And therefore, this is the Oritzvi Grimberg notion of how this was possible. And because of the Hester Panim, I do not understand. I cannot understand how they could do that, how they were led to the Furens, how our loved ones. Let us <laughs> grind our own teeth for the next string, a screen which is the hardest in the Orotzwe Greenberg experience of this regret from afar. And a, again, oi. A little bit of the Ivrit again, just so that we hear the sound. And Jean, are you willing to continue for yet another screen? Okay. As nasu b'shikshu kronot mugafim yehudim lemacholet kivshan mitzfafim, uveinam levenenu azay meloyam merchak v'shichecha ufas kesher shvilim ben nefesh le nefesh milyardei milin shikshu galgalim. ולילה שאין אחריו שחר לצאת מזה המסע הלילי השועט אל שטח העשב הרך רביטל ולנשום שוב לנשום אוויר חי וכחלחל. Let us do the English. Then they traveled in rattling sealed boxcars. Jews squeezed to the furnace's knife. And between them and us then, an ocean full. Dis full distance and forgetfulness, connecting trails, soul to soul, billions of miles, rattling wheels, and a dawnless night, no way out. From this galloping night's march to soft grass wet with dew, to breathe again, living blue air. And here our table crashed of abundance, our men are calves, our women heifers, we are jumping with laughter by the frolic of clowns from deep down over our abyss, a ball every night on our stages. We missed none of our joyful balls. We hugged as we must our wives by night, a layer of fat on our nape and belly. Okay, here you have it. The full guilt of the Yeshuv in Eros Israel. First of all, notice in the first part, and you, you can see that they are missing parts here that the scenery has changed. We are not anymore in the village scene where all the villagers and peasants are standing to watch how the Jews are led and they are taking a, their own whatever gains out of it. We have now moved to a totally different scenery, the trains, the boxcars where a travel in sealed boxcars and you, you know, how the notion of the sealed boxcar will reappear in that Pagis portrait, uh, the one that we can see just in front of the boxcar in Yad Vashem, uh, carved into the cement there. And now as we go through the image of Jews squeezed to the Ferenc knife, actually it's interesting, these two metaphors, of course, because Ferences do not have knives, but the Ma'achelet, a uh, which brings always back the notion of the akeda. It's not a regular sakin, it's not a knife, it's the biblical notion of the machelet. 
and between them and us an ocean full, distance and forgetfulness, connecting trails, soul to soul, billions of miles, rattling wheels. So as they are on their way, I here recognize the distance between them and us an ocean full. Something was severed, something happened. And to illustrate that, we go to the second part. And we have changed nothing in our lives. We continued jumping and dancing and having balls, etc. Lo garano ein, the third line, but last on this page on the Hebrew. Lo garano echad ashu'enu. We miss none, not even one of our joyful balls. And even the intimate, personal, individual part, I did not stop having sex. I continued my regular, normal, intimate life was my beloved, and so did all of us. How could we? I'd like to take a minute's break here because I have been bothered by this, you know, millions of miles in between what was happening in Delta Israel. And similar things could be said about America, but I'm not American, I'm Israeli. And I was born here in British Mandate Palestine immediately afterwards. So this bothered me more. And one of the things that I have done in my way of studying literature, and if my well-known to you and others love of Alterman, I started looking into what Alterman had done during that time. And, and he, he has amazing poetry relating to, to what is happening in Europe as far as he knows it, and I'm not referring to that right now. But in 1943, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Treblinka, everything, Alterman is actually putting on stage Shlomo HaMelech Veshelmaya Sandlar, one of the most beautiful, hilarious, colorful, comic musicals. And there are many, many repeated performances of that, and maybe one of you have seen it. It's an amazing musical for which Alterman had written the songs. He didn't write the play. Sammy Groneman wrote the play. But Alterman did an upgraded version of that. Uh, I see you, Matt. I'll come to you in a moment. And, and created the songs to be sung while this is happening in Europe. So I'm not saying that I'm putting uh, Alterman on a pedestal and, and making him the guilty one for what is happening. I'm using this as an example of my way to try and look into the realities of life in Eretz Israel at the time. And indeed, Eretz Greenberg is absolutely right. And so maybe again, these are his years of silence. Maybe what he said in those years of silence is, I am going on with my normal life, but at least I will not write. I will not publish. This is the least that I can do to mark the difference between these days and the rest of my life. Yes, Matt, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Well, I was just, I guess this isn't the, isn't the end of the, this horrible poem, but... It's not yet the end. It's another, far another, from way the end. Of, another way to look at this is he's writing this in 1945, and his faith that Israel could be born and survive. He's not it's writing awesome. this in 45. We don't know when he is writing it. Ah. It's published in the 50s. Okay. I thought in, on, a, on a cover... No, page. no, 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 no. It's published in the 50s. It's... Uh, I don't know. You're right. You're right. It's Rosh Hashanah 45. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. It is. Go back to your remark. I made a mistake. Uh, please unmute yourself. Matt? I, I lost you for a second. I thought you, you were talking about something else already. Okay. No, no, no. I was not. And I just corrected myself. And you are right. This is from Erev Rosh Hashanah, the first Rosh Hashanah, and the state of Israel is not yet born. 
just the full fact of the Shoah. It was my mistake. The book is published later, but this particular poem is published in the paper. And therefore your comment is valid. And would you like to repeat it? I'm just admiring his faith or, or respecting his faith that Israel would exist and be born, be born and survive. I mean, even in 48, we didn't know if Israel was going to be surviving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, that faith or that ability or sensitivity to what is going to come is again a characteristic of Olsvig Greenberg, and we have seen in his poetry the ability to see ahead. So yes, he must have faith in the time to come, and thank you for that. Uh, anybody else? Let, uh, as you said, let us continue with this horrible poem uh, so that we can reach its conclusion and then the one I want to keep for the end. Okay, so this is the highlighting, if you wish, of the testimony of guilt of how life in Jewish Eros Israel continues while this is going on. Okay. And now again, another vision that he has. A uh, Jody, would you like to take over the reading for for the rest of the poem? Okay. Moving and holding my knees by evening, the holiest, the purest of all the world's children, Shmuel, my sister's only son, and he is a child and a saint like my great father, killed by sword. Uncle, oh, uncle, I always loved you. How could you leave me in the hands of the killer to go to Jerusalem, oh, uncle? And you did not wake for us, King David. You did not go to Hebron, to the forefathers' graves, to tell them how Esau is killing Jacob. How can you live thus without us, uncle, to eat and to drink, wearing clothing and more? And I answer every evening to little Shmuley, I sinned, I transgressed, I committed crimes from my toenails to my head's hair. The pain of this crime burns in me, my lamb. I wish I was with you in the earth. I wish I was with you in the ashes. I cannot bear the knowledge of your end. How can I live without you and without you, my beloved? And how can I live without you all and without you, my beloved? Blood always trickles through the roof of my poems. It cries out of your mouths in my wall. Okay. Now, this is a true story. As Uri Svi Grimberg, who visited Poland in the late 30s, I mentioned that to you, as a Beitar Shaliach, mind you. The plan was for him to bring out his nephew. Mm. This is what was supposed to happen. And then whatever, they couldn't work out the bureaucracy or maybe his sister, the child's mother, did not finally want to, to, to let the child go. Whatever transpired, he did not bring the child. And then this will seep totally into Rehovot HaNahar and will continue time and again to surface this great guilt and again, before he is ready in his answer, we'll come to his answer in a moment, to tell us about his own feelings of guilt, what he lets us listen to, which is probably in his ears and in his mind's eyes, is the voice of the nephew, uncle or uncle. And maybe these hopes that I have an uncle in Eros Israel, he will go to Hebron, he will go to King David grave and pray for us and the miracle will happen. You need to remember that Olsvi Grimberg comes from a very observant traditional family. So in his mind, that would be the way of thinking that even if he cannot come with a sword at the gate of Treblinka, he can at least do what Jews would do, go to the holy graves and pray. And this is what Shmuley would want him to do. And now look at the answer just beneath my block and I answer every evening. So this is a constant presence in his life. And as you look at the 
end of this part, you will see the totally Yom Kippur style, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Avinu, Pashanu, etc. Chatati, Aviti, Pashati, Kdoshi, my holy one. Okay, I committed all these crimes and sins, and this is an ongoing, the blood indeed will continue seeping into his poetry. All right, let me, uh, will you continue, Judy, for a bit? I'm already highlighting that which we will speak about. There is a voice saying, please unmute. There is a voice saying, what shall we hope for? No holidays anymore. We better sink into the sea, to the home of the fishes. We shall meet all those whose boats drowned on the shore of Istanbul in the sea. We sawed a dream and reaped terror. We were led by fools, not by sages with vision. To the magic of diaspora, to the gates of disaster. Happily fooled all the way to the yellow patch, now to the abyss. I know it is forbidden to say this, in spite of the burning coals in, this heart, in the heart, the true one is commanded to dress the heart's wounds. One must wash the faces and their garments of the crying with myrrh waters, just like before ascending to the temple. And bring the musicians to play their instruments of song, all the tunes of my people from Sinai. I will grind the bitter desolation with my teeth. I will spit it out like congealed blood purified as after a fog I will sing, although my heart in me is breaking up. Please conclude. There are rules for the ones who aspire to kingdom. There, those who follow the rules reach the kingdom. They in the fire of battle and their sons, thanks to them, they have a land and they have a sea. Okay. So you can see that towards the conclusion of this poem, the one opening Rechovot HaNahar, published Erev Rosh Hashanah, the first Chagim after the Holocaust, after describing what he can see in his mind's eyes of what transpired there in much more detail than we have read, after letting go and letting us hear the terrible pain and guilt there is this sort of pulling yourself together. I know it is forbidden to dwell on mourning. I know that there must be a Jewish way to handle this. We will continue singing. We will continue building. And we will rejoice in the fact that we have a land and they have a sea. And as you well said, Matt, three years before the establishment of the State of Israel. There is a total belief that that will happen. Let me take a minute as we are leaving behind us Hatsufe Kina Lebet David and Lebet Israel and see if there are any comments and questions because I left my very hard to say favorite about this poetry, but the one that really speaks to me very strongly as as the Uruzvi Greenberg voice about lessons of the Shoah, okay, from his perspective and how he sees it. Okay, so let me start by telling you a story, and this is a true one, and maybe I told it to some of you already, so I will not make it very detailed. It's about, I'm going to say, three years old, and I was already working with Pardes for many years, working with Hartman. And I was on one of those Skypes or phone conversation with the person who was who running the summer programs for the Hartman Institute for the Rabunim. And we finished the conversation with the choice of topics for my session, Babla. And then she says to me, Rachel, I got a question from this friend I had. These are two women rabbis. A, I don't know if reform or conservative, irrelevant to what we are doing. I said, my friend, the rabbi from London, who also studied at Hartman with me, 
is looking for a poem and it's all about a son who promises his mother not to ever let go of the gun. Do you know it? Now here is the moment of confession that knowing Israeli poetry for Israelis like myself is oftentimes tinted, marked, you use any other descriptive term that you want, but it's marked by your ideology. It's not to say that I know all of Altman by heart, but it would ring a bell. I am far from knowing all of you the Avichai by heart, but I would know how to find. When this woman said this, I had no clue. And I said, I'm sorry, nothing comes to mind. Now, this is a Friday noonish time. Okay. I was probably speaking to her early in the morning, which was late night for her because she's a night person. So she likes to do the meetings late at her end early here. And Yossi and I are driving to see the kids, food in the car and all that. And I'm listening to the radio. So Friday noonish, they already have these programs of Shabbat is coming kind of thing, you know? has nothing to do with religiosity. It's just the Israeli way of doing stuff. And they are having a person choose a poem to read. And the, the guy is Achim Meir, who used to be a television anchorman, now retired. And he starts reading a poem. And this is it. A son who is promising his mother, etc. And it's Uri Tzvi Grimberg. And I, I literally yelled, Yossi almost made an accident. Because like, it cannot be true, you know, the very same day with a few hours apart. And then I go, of course I don't know it because it's Uri Tzvi Grimberg. I, I don't read Uri Tzvi Grimberg, you know, I do Alterman. Which, which is, was a moment for me to look at myself, you know, and say, how come, Rachel, that it would not even ring a bell? So now I have a dilemma because now Shabbat is appro approaching and I'm not a Shabbat observant person. I could show you in my camera that I have the complete works of Chaim Gori, Orsvi Greenberg, Ami Chaylea, Goldberg, Rachel. Should I continue? I did not have one copy of Orsvi Greenberg. Zilch. I used to have Rechavot Nahar. I couldn't find it. I bought a new copy. I know many people of my friends that will have Uri Tzvi Greenberg. But you know how this works in our world? All my friends who would have the complete works of Uri Tzvi Greenberg are Shomrei Shabbat. <laughs> and Shabbat is coming. And most of my friends who do poetry are women. And they are not doing Facebook two hours before Shabbat, you know, they're doing other stuff. So I say, Yossi, now you will watch magic. I'm going to post now and I will have answers after Havdalah. He says, how can you be so sure? I said, because I can be sure. I know this world I'm living in. I am ashamed of the position I am at right now. But this is what will happen. As we are driving, I'm posting. As far as I could remember details from Achimei reading the poem. Nothing happens throughout Shabbat as I expected. An hour after Avdallah, I have three copies in my email. And, and two posted with a few remarks like shame on you and how could you not and blah, blah, blah but you will have me when I need Alterman kind of thing. And, and that was it. So this is the story, how I came to know about this poem. And ever since then, trust me that not only did I learn a lesson, but I also started teaching it. So here is the poem as it appeared by Oritz V. Greenberg, as the custom was at the time 
in the paper. And the paper is, of course, Cherut. And it is called Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. And here is the screenshot from the paper. And here is the date. And here it is bigger for you so you can see it. It's December 17th, 1948. Tetvav Kislev. So it is Hanukkah, right? Or close to Hanukkah, not yet Hanukkah, a week before Hanukkah. It's Friday, and it's a few months after the declaration of the state of Israel. What, of course, for me is yet another moment of realization, Rachel, just like your way of doing things, Alterman is publishing every Friday a poem in Davar, or it's the Greenberg is publishing El Herot. Will you finally take the trouble to look at the other side of the whole mm -hmm. and start looking at these things together as these poets are talking to the Israeli audience? So again, this is my Shi'or, and now we go to the poem. You can see it's long, and we will do parts of it. Okay, so Kodesh Kodeshim. Uh, shall we go back to you, Josie, for the reading? I'm doing a little bit of the reading in Ivrit, and when we will go through the whole poem, but I want for you to pay attention. This is, if you wish, fantasy nightmare dream. It is published in 1948. This is about three years or more after Ulrich Greenberg knows that the whole of his family perished in Belzitz, okay? Which is a smaller version of Auschwitz, but death by gas. His mother, father, etc. And he tries to imagine he could not be there at the gate to save them. His prayers, by the graves of King David and the forefathers did not help. So now he's doing his dream tikkun. He will appear at Belzus and catch the body of the mother as it is dying. And will do the only possible tikkun of a proper burial in Eretz Israel imaginary one with the proper washing of the body, all the graces that were denied beyond life, even a proper death. Okay, let us hear the poem Kodesh Kodeshim again. My translation, do not hesitate to correct and suggest better ways. Bevakasha. At, <clears throat> at the last moments when the eyes burst out and the blood started flowing, and the body had dropped, dropped into my arms, because I appeared there at the sight of killing. And I had said, full of pity, mother, mother, she raised her head and placed it on my shoulder, and said, my son, my son, she forgot it was Belzitz, the sacrificial altar. And I said, yes, mother, yes, your son, did you know, my son, the Goyim are killing me? I knew, mother. Blessed are you, my God. My son is alive. I will correct myself and <laughs> stop you for a moment here. And, and, and maybe a couple of more times just to point out things. So here we go. Look at the first verse that we are reading. In this fantasy nightmare tikkun, he visualizes himself catching the body of his mother. And in his mind, her main concern would be to find out whether they knew in Eretz Israel. Can you see the echo to the first poem? Because this is a very late part of Rehovot Anar, the streets of the river. It's like from the sixth part. And so he knows that they would have wanted to know if we knew. And now, which is already a few years later, 
he imagines his mother's answer. He would confess, I know mother, did you know much time? I knew mother. Is she angry in his mind? No. Blessed are you, my God, my son is alive. I know, says Uritzvi Greenberg, that they wouldn't be angry at us. My mom would be happy that we survived in El Israel. So can you see the change of phase from the guilt of the early poem? The responsibility, the guilt is still here, but there is an understanding my mother would not be angry. She would be grateful that we, were, we survived in El Israel. Let's continue. The wind had carried us, my mother in my arms, and the wind placed us at the entrance of a forest with a stream at our feet. Did you bring us to Lebanon, my son? To Lebanon, mother, blessed are you, my God, I can smell the scent of Lebanon. Ah, I hear splashing water, my son. Indeed, water, mother, have you placed the Jordan at my feet, my son? The Jordan, my mother, take me to the Jordan, my son, let its purifying waters pass over me. I will take you to the Jordan, mother. The cool water will heal me, my son. Ah, ah, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Thank you, God. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. When I was a young girl, my son, splashing in the river during Tammuz evenings, I was thinking about the Jordan water in our Eretz Yisrael. Oh, if we had but merited, and here is the Jordan at our feet. Yes, my mother, the wind is upon me, waves, rolling and light touching. Is it evening? Evening tide, mother, stars and moon upon you. Okay, let me just highlight a few things. And the most important one to me is, of course, two. The Eretz Israel scene here is not necessarily a concrete Eretz Israel, but to me, rather a Shira Shirim Eretz Israel, which would be the way his mother would know Eretz Israel. Iti Milvanon Tavoi Tashori, the beloved comes. A, with, well, with the lover from Lebanon, the purifying water of Jordan, of course, will serve here another image in his mind, and that is the right of proper rachatza and burial that none of the victims of the Holocaust was granted if we only merited, well, she did merit a rachatza in the Jordan and the purifying. The other nice element here is that his mother in his imagination, because she is dead by the time this is written, if she had the opportunity to take her to River Jordan, she would reminisce about her splashing in the river by her hometown when in the months of Tammuz. So in his memory and probably in the reality of these communities, especially with the particular Hasidic background that Oritz Greenberg comes from, his mother did not go to the river in her own hometown town in June or July. She went in Tammuz. They lived by the Hebrew calendar. They lived by the Hebrew rhythm of time, no matter how far away they have been. And the last line that probably, Josie, you cannot see on your screen, I'm reading. Upon you two stars and moon, my son, yes, mother, pick me up in your arms, my son, and take me away from the water, my son, and we come to the last part. Please continue reading. Like this, lay me down on the grass, my son. Dew is falling nearby and it is warm, like tears, my son. Warm like tears, mother, let me feel your body, my son. Your clothes are coarse woven fabric, my son, soldiers wear, 
a rifle on your shoulder. Hurrah to you, my son. Until we arrive to Jerusalem, my son. Yes, mother. And when we get to Jerusalem, my son, the royal temple city. Just leave the compare. This was done for my teaching. Yes, continue. The, the royal temple city of kings. Oh, not even on Shabbat. Will you change these clothes, my son? Once I wanted to see you dressed in silk. I do not want that anymore. As you say, mother, and always with the rifle, my son. Amen, mother. And even when the goel comes and people will beat their swords into plowshares and they would throw their guns into the fire. Not you, no, my son, not you. No, mother, in case the goyim rise again and amass iron. Should they rise once more and we shall not be ready as we were not ready till now. Oh, your words are holy mother. Let me now fall asleep in your arms, my son. A night with my son and God on River Jordan. God is with us on the River Jordan, mother. The Jordan flows to the end of all roads. Blessed he who reaches its shores alive. The secret of our tears are in it the strength of eternity it. It is the world of Selah, here my son, forever mother. Okay, can you find a better text ever to speak, to articulate, articulate that one of the two main messages that you can hear in Israel as a result of the Shoah. Here is the classic one. After what had transpired, never again shall be found, be found lacking for the ability to protect ourselves. Even if the Goel comes, we will not let go of our gun, we will not let go of our military attire, no matter what, because chas v'chalila, God forbid, we shall not be ready again. While this is absolutely true for many of us, I want for you to be aware of the fact that there is Israeli poetry not less strong that will say, after what was done unto us, how can we not consider the plight of others? So these are the two truths, if you wish, for the different, sometimes opposing reading of the term never again. Never again to us, the Uritzvi Greenberg voice, never again shall be found lacking for the ability to defend ourselves, And on the other side of the liberal continuum, never again to anybody else. And we shall not be the ones killing innocent, unarmed people. And both messages can be found in lessons of the Shoah that people who have come out of it or just figured out their way of understanding it. I know this is an issue that we oftentimes find ourselves disagreeing upon. So this is why I left some time for conversation following that. Go ahead, Matt, and then anybody else who wants to join. The, the comparison you pose is not equal. We can certainly feel compassion and not even even not occupy people if I could go that far left, which for me is really hard, but because I don't like using the word occupy. But you can do all that and have compassion, but it doesn't mean that you don't have the means to defend yourself. And this poem is about keeping the means to defend yourself. It it doesn't have to do with you know the left can say forever, which they do. You know, we got to be nice to everybody. We have compassion. We went through this. We shouldn't put anybody else through it. But we cannot give up our ability to defend ourselves. Okay? I mean, that's... But you remember, it's a person of the left that brought you this poem. 
I, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm picking on your comparison because I don't think it's equally valid. Okay. Uh -huh. I mean, it's like, it's like we have this problem. We're holding a poisonous snake in our hand. And if we drop it, it's likely to bite us in the leg and kill us. That's my, the way I see the situation. And this is why we are listening to Oritz Greenberg today. And thank you for that, Matt. Yes, Esther. I want to go along the lines of Matt and say that in, in, Ju in Judaism, one has to think about having compassion for its enemies. It is not a given. That's a lot of what Judaism is also saying. Okay, thank you for that, Esther. Hey, Dorothy, please go ahead. You will need to unmute. Yes, compassion, but not at the expense of our life or our survival. Mm -hmm. Why are you so angry at me? I'm not angry, no. <laughs> I am... Um, I'm not angry. Okay, I hope you're not. Thank you very and much. One, and one doesn't eliminate the other. They can go together. You try to do the least damage as possible, as opposed to doing the most damage as possible. Mm -hmm. But as you said, not at the expense. Okay, thank you. So you, I hope, understand that I am not going to go into this argument today. No, of course. <laughs> the, the two things I'd like to leave on the table. One is that I am the person who brought you this poem. I am the person who told you the story before, how I felt responsible to not owning this part of our poetic heritage. And I'm therefore also the person who will tell you that it's not this and compassion. The word used by the other camp is not compassion. It's justice. What? Okay. It's another vocabulary. So maybe the day will come that I will have courage enough to bring to Pardes another poem that will say that other voice and also be ready. Well, this one says, mm -hmm. protect yourself, and you say, which always Rigerenberg doesn't, and also be compassionate. Okay? So it's, it's, it's a question, not so much of two opposing values, but probably the, the way of weighing the cost of one at the expense of the other. Okay? and maybe finding a way of handling both. And I think our main problem in these debates in Israel nowadays and before is that for most people it's either or, and it shouldn't be either or. And, and that's the complexity of the thing. But as I said, this is not the purpose of our exercise. Our, the purpose mm -hmm. of our exercise is to learn Ulrich Greenberg. And Ulrich Zvi Greenberg is the clear voice of that. And this is what I wanted for us to hear and study today. The voice of the victims of the Holocaust. My mother is telling us that we should never let go of our gun, no matter what, even Mashiach times. I mean, you will have to agree that this is taking it in a very strong way. Yes, Jean, please. Um, I just wanted to say that I think the, um, as it were, the complexity of the issue is because both sides are right. Both sides, and if you what, can- What is left, Jean? <laughs> <laughs> Correct, but left or right. But you know what I mean, and I think yeah, that's course, why I'm it's so difficult. Yeah, I was trying to conclude on a lighter yeah. mood, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think this, this is it. And therefore, I, I would say my learning, we absolutely need to be able to hear Ulrich V. Greenberg, no matter how liberal, left-wing, other side we are. And when I am in my own camp, I will say this, 
you know what, I'll conclude with a story and then I'll say goodbye and Shabbat Shalom. I have on Thursday, 7 p.m., a class in Ivrit where I teach Alterman. And a, for a whole year now, we are doing nothing but Alterman. And at a certain, and I have a person, a participant who is a poet in her own right. I even taught in our circles a poem by her about the Akeda. Her name is Yudit Kafri. She is 86 years of age. She lives in Maskerot Batya, not so far away. I admire her poetry. She is as left as they come and a little bit further. She was born on the kibbutz of Hashomer at Sa'ir. She, uh, she wrote a, a historical book about an acquaintance of her family who was a anti-Nazi communist fighter, a woman. The book is called Jos Zosha, available in English, unbelievably beautiful. And, and Judith is such a smart and enlightened woman. And in one of my lessons, my Alterman classes, I was making a reference, just a reference to Oritz Greenberg, you yeah. know? And sh a comparison of a notion I think that the thing of publishing on Friday in the newspaper and expressing your opinion and said, and you know, in an equivalent way in Herut, she went up in arms. How dare I even pronounce the horrible name or it's the Greenberg uh, because of what he said about Migdala Emek. And now you know Mishmara Emek. And now you know Mishmara Emek. And, and I let her speak as I let people speak. And then we, we continued with the class. And then she wrote me a letter of apology. And she said, actually, Rachel, I should not apologize to you. I should apologize to Oris Greenberg. Because as a poet, I know the value of his poetry. So this is exactly it. In a circle where I teach Alterman, I would mention Oris Greenberg. And I have somebody flaring up. And in a different circle, if I will mention a very left wing, like a Yitzhak Leor or whatever, if, if you, were, you were readers of Hebrew poetry, you would know who I'm talking about, or Yona Volach on whatever, and I will have the, the class up in arms. It's the up in arms that is the pain. And the, my call upon all of us, and first of all, myself, to read, to know, to be open to the complexities and the different voices. And I think with that, I would like to conclude today. So uh, I wish you all Shabbat Shalom and a good conclusion, of course, of our Omer series. And I will let you, Deborah, conclude the class. How is your eye? How is your eye? My eye? Yeah, you remember. You went, you went to the doctor for, for your eyelid. It's a process. It's a process. I'll report back when I have results. Not yet there. <laughs>